Brother John West, most of you, if not all of you, know, native of Mississippi, married to Sonia, and their three children, Lauren, Jonathan, and Joshua, members here, and John works with the church also over in Dayton, has for some time. He's preached full-time in Mississippi and Alabama and conducted lectureships and meetings in several states. He's been involved in some mission work over in uh, Grenada and also in the United Kingdom, England. Uh, he's a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching, Faulkner University and Fried Harden University, holding the uh, bachelor's and master's degree. He involved with us and works as the academic dean and instructor in the Truth Bible Institute. And uh, his latest endeavor uh, is to be a deputy sheriff from Montgomery County. And there may be some of you all who are going north when you leave here. Um, I don't know where to say to try to do it when he's off duty or on duty. I don't know really where it makes much difference. But uh, be aware that the long arm of the law might be there coming from the man of the east named West who chose to go west and be a sheriff. <laughs> I think he'll always be of heart a gospel preacher. And we're grateful that he's going to be speaking to us this hour on what are the Pentecostal and charismatic churches. So please give ear to what he has to say and study along with him in your Bible. Okay. It is good once again to be back with you. As David mentioned, I just started out not too long ago, just about three months ago. Uh, as a deputy with Montgomery County, enjoying that so far. Uh, of course, you have people like Terry Hightower. He, he always has something. He emailed Sonia the other day and says, should he be cautious when he comes? Will, will I have someone waiting at the airport to arrest him, or will I just arrest him when he comes to the building? And uh, I brought my handcuffs with me in case he came a little early, see if we could just at least handcuff him. And I was trying to find something we might could arrest him for, and the only thing I could think of would be a noise ordinance. <laughs> but that's just a ticket. We can make an exception in his case and still take him to jail, but uh, definitely uh, I think a noise ordinance would apply to Terry because uh, the longer he talks, the more decibels he produces, and the louder it gets, and it violates noise ordinance. So uh, I have to tell Terry that when he gets here. I haven't been able to see him yet. I don't guess he is here yet, but anyway, when he gets here, maybe we'll get a chance to have fun with him. What are the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches? Well, that's a very interesting question, and if you look around today in, in religion, you'll see this group, actually several different uh, bodies of, of Charismatic churches. As a matter of fact, this infiltrated most denominations. We'll talk about that throughout this lesson. But you'll see the Pentecostal, the Oneness Holiness, the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, and, and others by similar names that hold to these particular doctrines. Well, the Pentecostal movement started approximately 100 years ago more in your rural, uneducated, low-income areas. Uh, those types of people adhered to it. They, there was something that appealed to them for whatever reason, and they latched on and, and continued to follow it. But we see that Pentecostalism has grown far beyond the rural, rural and low-income areas and even among uneducated people. You have some who are well-educated who are in the Pentecostal movement now. And over the past 25 to 30 years, you've seen this movement grow in leaps and bounds, made great strides among themselves uh, and among uh, many people in the United States and worldwide over their doctrines and their beliefs. Pentecostalism is continuing to grow, and it's growing through mainline denominations. A lot of the denominations started adopting charismatic views just to keep their own members they were losing their own members to the Pentecostal movement, and so they started changing. I remember back in the mid-90s, uh, my uncle, who at that time was a preacher, uh, was in a, a group, I guess, in town. They had some moral issues going on. I believe it was alcoholism trying to come into town, and all the preachers of various religions gathered together to see what they could do about fighting this as a moral issue. And he said that he heard one of the denominational preachers, I believe it was a Baptist preacher if I remember correctly, uh, say the prayer for them. And he said, you would think it was a Pentecostal saying the prayer. 
was some of the things he was saying. That, that is true. Your mainline denominations have gotten more charismatic and Pentecostal in their own beliefs just to maintain their own membership. Well, this movement started, as I mentioned, just over 100 years ago, and the man who is credited as being the father of modern-day Pentecostalism is Charles Fox Parm. Charles Parm was a deeply religious young man, and as he grew, he entered into uh, Kansas or the Southwest Kansas College to study religion. He decided he wanted to become a preacher. He united himself with the Methodist Church for a period of time, but they did not like some of his charismatic leanings, so he left the Methodist Church, and he formed basically your Pentecostal-type movement. He called them Bible churches. He, he had started a Bible school. The Bethel Bible College was started in Topeka, Kansas, 1901. And it is said that it is here where uh, your modern-day Pentecostalism began. He started having more and more contacts with younger people, encouraging them to come to his Bible college, and thus had a uh, larger uh, attendance of young people starting this college. Parham, though, was a, considered himself an evangelistic man. He didn't stay around the college very long. He would have other people taking care of the day-to-day -day operations. He would go out and do evangelistic campaigns. Well, just before he left on one of his campaigns, he told the students there that they need to pray fervently for the miracle of the Holy Spirit and for the gift of tongues and other miraculous gifts. So it was reported that while he was on one of his evangelistic campaigns, that a young lady named Agnes Osman, uh, after someone laid their hands upon her, she began to speak in tongues. Now, there was no report on what she said, which I don't think they probably knew what she said. There's a lot of gibberish. But they were touting that as the first instance of the speaking of tongues among the Bethel Bible College. So upon, Fox, or upon uh, Parm's return, and hearing this great news in his own ears, he decided to shut the school down. You'd think that would gain more popularity of the school, but he shut the school down and took the students on the road with him. He thought that would gain more popularity. About 1903, he found himself in Galveston, Texas, of all places, and he held a huge revival in Galveston to convert as many people as he could. He converted several people. Along the way, though, during these campaigns, a lot of people would adhere to his teachings. They believed what he said, but a lot of people also ridiculed him because he couldn't do everything he said he could do. But after he got to Galveston, he gained a great following. He moved on up into Houston and started another Bible school as well as a Bible church, supposedly. And with that, he gained more and more students. Well, it was during that time that a black Baptist preacher who joined with him, decided he wanted to get involved in uh, this particular movement, and Parham allowed him to come into school. Uh, William Joseph Seymour was this black Baptist preacher. Now, why would I even mention his ethnicity? Well, when you study Parham's background, he was a strict segregationist, and later on was accused of having ties to the KKK. He allowed... Seymour to enter his school, but he would not allow him to sit in classes. Where they would normally shut the door to the classroom, he left it cracked just a little bit so Seymour could sit in the hall and listen through the crack at the teaching of what was going on. Well, Seymour gained in popularity among those around him, and in about 1906, he left and went to California. He decided he wanted to start his own mission. He had enough schooling. He learned enough, he thought that he could start his own mission or his own movement. Well, in the fall of 1906, Parham went out to California to see Seymour to come to an evangelistic revival campaign that Seymour was having. But it was during that time that Parham didn't like what he saw. Apparently, according to Parham, he said he, he was dismayed at the ecstatic praying and frenzied dancing going on during the worship. Well, that would bring you to modern-day Pentecostalism. They still do that. As a matter of fact, when uh, I was preaching for a small congregation years ago, I had a Bible study with some of the Pentecostals in, in the town. One of the elders and I went to conduct a study. And during the study, one of the, the people in it, we were studying a whole family, one of them said, well, well, you know we go to the Church of God there in town. We said, yes, we, we know where you go. And they said, well, we want to tell you something that just happened not long ago. And they started talking about 
They said this woman got under the power of the Spirit. She was dancing in the aisles. And they went through all the things that they were doing. They said, and the Holy Spirit left her and she fell out from under the Spirit and she hit the floor hard and she was a big woman. Well, imagine trying to hold a straight face during a Bible study when they're telling a story like that. I didn't. I started laughing. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just that picture in my mind, I can't help but laugh. And they started laughing and said, you should have been there. <laughs> well... They confirmed exactly what was going on even a hundred years ago with the dancing and the things going on in their worship. My dad worked with a, a man years ago back in the 70s that he had a brother that was a Pentecostal preacher. And they were talking about a revival that they were having and said during the midst of the revival, one of the men jumped the pew under the power of the Spirit when he fell and broke his arm. And they said they had to call the ambulance. My dad said, well, why would you have to call the ambulance? Y'all claim to have faith healing. Why didn't you just heal him? He said, oh, we need to get him to the hospital. He said, that just proves how false you are. Well, the man that worked with him wasn't too happy or pleased with what my dad said, but he told him the truth, and the man wasn't definitely happy about it, but he couldn't disprove it. They could not heal the man of a broken arm. If they had what they claim they, could, they do have, then they could have laid hands on him or spoke to him and healed his arm, arm immediately without having to call an ambulance. Why call an ambulance and have the man pay our ambulance bill, an emergency room bill, have his arm in the cast for six weeks, heal him immediately and there'd be no pain and no problems? Well, that's what's been going on for the last hundred years in this movement. Well, shortly after this 1906 revival, Parm and Seymour disassociated themselves one from another. Seymour's popularity, though, continued to, to grow while Parm's diminished. The Azusa Street Mission, where... Seymour was preaching at that time, uh, attracted thousands of people. And eventually, that particular church in California sent thousands of missionaries throughout the whole world for the Pentecostal movement. And it is there where the Pentecostals gained their popularity. Parham may be considered the father of, of modern-day Pentecostalism, but it was Seymour who actually made that movement popular. And it was through his work that gained in the popularity that caused it to be really what it is now. Uh, that set the, the groundwork for a lot of it. The reason Parm's popula popularity started decreasing was because of some of his erratic, weird, and crazy views he held. And he held a lot of weird views even uh, for some of your Pentecostals of that day. One of the things he did believe, which was believed by a lot of the Pentecostals, was faith healing. We're going to talk about that in detail in answering this false doctrine. But he believed in faith healing. The problem was he couldn't heal like he said. He had a one-year-old son died of an illness. He couldn't heal him before he died. He had a 16-year-old son sometime later that died of another illness. He couldn't heal that 16-year-old son. And even later on, he had a grown 37-year-old son who also died of an illness, and he failed to heal him. People started seeing his in inconsistencies. They also started seeing it within his own, with his own body. Parm had a lot of health problems throughout his entire life. He could not heal himself. He could not make himself better. He continually battled with health problems. But one thing that I guess was, as we would say today, a kicker to causing him more and more problems and causing his popularity to completely fade away was he had a small nine-year-old girl that he tried to heal in one of his revival sessions, and she died not long after that. And he was proven to be fake and false. People should have started seeing, though, that the entire movement was false, not just Parm. But they didn't. They looked at him as because of some of his other odd views as it was just him. That was the problem, not the Pentecostal movement in general. By 1913, the Pentecostal movement splintered into several groups, including the Church of God in Christ, the Assemblies of God, the United Pentecostal Church, and the Pentecostal Church of God. And you'll see some variation of that today. Though some of them are getting away from those titles, they're calling themselves other types of movements, some Bible churches, some community-type churches. You're seeing community church now under the umbrella of, of all sorts of different religions. Uh, you're seeing some in the church that are dropping the name Church of Christ, community church. I've heard of the Baptists and Methodists and others in certain places of the United States, particularly dropping those names and going to community church as well as some of you Pentecostals. They're trying to get away from, as they call it, the stigma of a title to get people in. And then they still do the same thing. They still believe the same thing. They just change the title on the sign and on the building. And they're still just as false as they ever were. That's why we're talking about counterfeit churches in this particular lectureship. Well, what are the practices and teachings of the Pentecostal movement? 
Well, one of the big things, and you'll see this among a lot of your denominations, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Pentecostals made this popular uh, during this time of Parm and even after Parm. According to their statement of faith in the Pentecostal Charismatic Churches of North America and their association, they say this, that they believe the full gospel, including the holiness of heart and life, healing for the body and baptism in the Holy Spirit with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. So they say that to prove they've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues. And that's just an outward showing that the, that the Holy Spirit's in them in a baptismal way. Pentecostal believe that when one is baptized in the Holy Spirit, it gives them a wonderful experience of God and the power for ministry, especially witnessing to others. The evidence or sign of this baptism is the speaking in tongues from this same website. The baptism of the Holy Spirit also from this website says it is a second encounter with God. The first is conversion, in which the Christian begins to receive the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Now that's what they say, and that is what they believe. Well, when you look over in the Bible, in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. If you remember in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 16, Peter says, This is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. In verses 17 through 21, he quotes the prophecy from Joel 2, 28 through 32. The reason I quoted Joel 2, 28 and 29, this is a verse that was on that website for their proof that the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all flesh and that they speak in tongues and they perform other miraculous acts. But if you notice in the Bible, the term all flesh does not refer to all living things. If all flesh referred to all living things, Fido would have the spirit. Little Fluffy the kitty cat would have the spirit. And all other animals. Well, if you mention that to the Pentecostals, they'll say, oh, no, no, it doesn't refer to that as only human beings. But then they want to get a little bit more specific with the human beings as the people that follow their doctrine will be the ones that have the Holy Spirit. But they want to say that it comes to all flesh. If they take all flesh literally, they've got to have the dogs, the cats, the horses, the cows, and every other animal that's in existence having a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. But they don't even go that far. It does not even refer to all humans. They want to limit it to humans, but it doesn't refer to all humans. Because if it referred to all humans, then that would include the atheist. I heard Brother Rose talking about the humanist. It would refer to the humanist. It would refer to other Types of people. What about sinners? All sinners, not just the atheists and humanists and other people. But if it referred to humankind, that would get your lost people with a baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Well, they won't even believe that. But again, they're still saying it comes to all flesh. They bring the all flesh back down to the Pentecostal movement. But if you become part of the Pentecostal movement, then you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you can get that. But when you look in the Bible, the Bible, particularly Acts 2, is clear enough that we should understand it, is referring to, to Jew and Gentile representing all nations. On Pentecost, some of those Jews present who obeyed the gospel received miraculous gifts. Cornelius and his household received a miraculous gift when they were baptized that would satisfy the Gentiles. But to whom was a baptism the Holy Spirit actually promised? By the way, when you look at the Bible and we understand that, it was a promise, not a command. The baptism in the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've seen it listed both ways. It never, has never been a command in the Bible. It was a promise. You look back in Acts 1 and Acts 2, it tells us to whom that promise was given. On Pentecost, the apostles were promised the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. They were told to wait in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high. Luke and Luke 24 said the same thing to them. This was not promised to the 120 that were there with them. Some people try to include the 120 as having the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit was only given to the apostles. If you look in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. Well, if you go to Acts 2 and verse 1, it tells us when they were one accord in one place, 
referring back, you have to bring Acts 126 into it. He's talking about the apostles who received that baptismal measure, and they were together when, in one accord in one place. So that baptismal measure was referring to the apostles, not to everybody on Pentecost, not to everybody who claimed to have some type of, of leaning or gift or measure. And some people claim that today, and they claim that baptismal measure along with any miraculous gift that they might have. Today, we cannot be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible doesn't teach that we have that. The Bible doesn't teach that we're commanded that. We can have that today because, number one, that baptism was a promise given to the apostles, not a command for us. But secondly, when Paul pre preached or wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, tell us there's one baptism... Now, if you have the water baptism, which Paul was speaking, and you have Holy Spirit baptism, then you've got two baptisms. And I know Mac will want to say that that's one baptism and two elements, but those were two separate baptisms in the Bible. And the Bible says we have one baptism today. It's the baptism of the Great Commission, water baptism. It's interesting, though, when you talk to Pentecostals, Pentecostals still will baptize their people in water and still say they're baptized with, with or in the Holy Spirit. They have two baptisms. The Bible teaches there's only one. It's interesting talking to the Pentecostals and some of the answers or the stuttering or whatever they try to come up with when you talk to them. A lot of them don't even know what to do or how to answer it because they know there's only the Bible teaches one baptism. Now, how can there be the Holy Spirit baptism with the apostles and then Paul preaches there's one baptism? Well, by the time Paul wrote Ephesians 4, there was only one baptism. No one else was receiving a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we don't today, despite what Mac and others may teach. And the Pentecostals, he's aligning himself right along the lines with these same Pentecostals. Just wonder how long it'll be before he goes completely Pentecostal in his belief and not only that, his teaching. He's already there in his belief but further in his teaching. Well, let's go further in this with the Pentecostals. Another thing that they say that you receive when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit is the speaking of tongues. And that's another false doctrine of this Pentecostal movement. They believe that the outward appearance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is their ability to speak in tongues, understood by these Pentecostals, not to speak in a foreign language without formal or academic study, but to speak in an unknown Heavenly language. You hear some of the gibberish that goes on among these folks. And you start pointing out, well, you're not speaking in a tongue. They say, well, it's an unknown tongue. It's a heavenly language. They'll use the New Testament of the King James Version where it talks about, particularly 1 Corinthians 14, having an unknown tongue. And they say, oh, that's the language of God. The, the words of angels. You can't understand that here. Only we can understand it. Sometimes we can't even understand it. We just speak it. We say some things. But if you listen to them, it's nothing but a bunch of gibberish. Matter of fact, Paul Baggett, a Pentecostal speak, uh, preacher, explains their speaking in tongues. He says this, This experience is also called being filled with the Spirit and is described in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts. The clear pattern is that everyone who is baptized in the Holy Spirit will speak in an unknown tongue or language as the initial physical evidence of his experience. So they say when you're baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit, you have an outward experience that you can prove you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that's when you start speaking in tongues. When you start speaking in tongues, that proves the Holy Spirit got a hold of you, and he did something to you. He jumped around in you and threw you in something and baptized you. And now you've got it, and this is evidence of it. Well, I can get up here and do some cartwheels. I'd probably break something. Dance around on the stage, which none of you would want to see me do. And I could start uh, doing a bunch of gibberish. I wouldn't want to see David either or anybody else here. Start doing a bunch of gibberish type talking, and I could claim anything. But what does that prove? Well, don't say anything. I, I know it might prove I'm crazy. It might prove a lot of other things. I'm on something <laughs> or uh, just acting goofy. But how does that prove anything with the Holy Spirit? Well, they claim the speaking of tongues proves that. But just saying a bunch of gibberish proves absolutely nothing. But in their false doctrine, the Pentecostals do believe that they 
receive that ability. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, they say they're just like Peter and the other apostles of the first day on Pentecost. That's why they call themselves Pentecostals. Because they can do the same thing that was done on Pentecost. Well, as we mentioned, these unfamiliar sounds and noises are not languages. It is gibberish. But according to them, their words are not meant to be understood by man. It's God talk. And only God can understand it. Well, there's another verse or two in the Bible that has something to say about that, doesn't it? You study the New Testament, it teaches that a language was a tongue. There is nothing mysterious about tongues. There is nothing more different uh, in speaking different languages that, would, that we have today than what they had in the first century. But the difference is those who had the ability to speak in tongues legitimately in the New Testament were those who had never studied a language. Just throw out a language. Chinese. I can't speak any Chinese. I had... My lieutenant asked me not long ago, can I even speak English? <laughs> but I don't speak Chinese. But if I started rattling off a lot of Chinese over the next five minutes, depending on, I guess, their dialect and just different languages I understand, the, or dialects in the Chinese language, but if I started spouting one off and never studied it, that would be something. But if I took a year of Chinese, a particular part of that, and I came in here and started speaking that, then... What's so special about it? Nothing. I've studied the language. In the New Testament, these men were speaking uh, different languages that they had never studied. Well, if you also look, the Greek word glossa is the word tongue, which we get our word language. And in Vine's Expository Dictionary, it defines this in part as an organ of speech, a language, the supernatural gift of speaking another language without its having been learnt. Now, that's exactly the way Vine said it. He goes on to explain tongues were for a sign not to believers but to unbelievers. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. And especially to unbelieving Jews. 1 Corinthians 14, 21. And he says also see passages in the book of Acts. He goes on to say there is no evidence of the continuance of this gift after apostolic times nor indeed in the latter times of the apostles themselves. This provides confirmation of the fulfillment in this way of 1 Corinthians 13, 8 in that this gift would cease in the churches just as would prophecies and knowledge in the sense of knowledge received by the immediate supernatural power. He said, see 1 Corinthians 14, 6. The completion of the Holy Scriptures has provided the churches with all that is necessary for individual and collective guidance, instruction, and edification. Folks, we have the Holy Scriptures today, and as Vines aptly pointed out, we do not need speaking in tongues or any miraculous gift of the Spirit. It's all been written down it's all recorded, and this is our guidebook today. What can someone speaking in tongues add to what God has already said in His Word? Absolutely nothing. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Paul said there was going to be a times where the gifts of knowledge and of prophecies would cease, but also of tongues, when that which is perfect has come. And that which is perfect has come. The revealed will of God's New Testament that I hold in my hand in written form today that we can read and study and obey. We do not need the speaking in tongues. They're not adding to. They're not helping anything with their worship. Just adding a bunch of gibberish that's not helping nor edifying anyone. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath the revelation, hath an interpretation. Notice the last phrase, let all things be done unto edifying. What's the purpose of the tongue or all other miraculous gifts? For edifying. Well, if you can't understand the tongue, are you edified by it? How can someone get up and speak a bunch of gibberish or as they want to call it, God talk, and I can't understand it, I don't know what's being said, Am I being edified by that? No, I'm not. But Paul goes further. In 1 Corinthians 14, 27 and 28, he says that if you have no one to interpret, here's what to do. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course let one interpret. Now notice verse 28. 
But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the churches and let him, not, uh, let him speak to himself and to God. Let him keep silence in the churches. In other words, Paul is saying in a nice way, if you don't have anybody to interpret what you're trying to speak, shut up because you're not helping anybody. Speak it to yourself and to God only because you're not edifying anybody for what you're doing. So what I'd say to the Pentecostals, if they want to claim they've got it but nobody can interpret, shut up. You're not helping me. I'd first of all tell them you're not doing it. You're fake and false. But just shut up because it, it, this is nothing that's going to edify or strengthen anybody. Do they do that? No, they'll keep right on. They're going to keep on and keep on. And they'll say, well, I'm talking to God and God knows. And you can be edified just by knowing that I'm saying something even if you can't understand it. I don't speak Spanish either. I know there's some of you, Ken, I know can speak some Spanish. There's some others here who can speak Spanish. Well, if I got up and spoke Spanish, which I can't do either, but if I did my entire lesson in Spanish because I knew the language, I might edify one or two of you, but how are the rest of you going to be edified if you don't know what I'm saying? If I go to Mexico and I can't speak Spanish, but I can take an interpreter. If I'm speaking English and they can't understand what I'm saying, how can I convert people to Jesus Christ if they can't understand the language I'm using and to tell them what they need to do to be saved unless I've got somebody to interpret what I'm doing? That's not a miraculous thing. That's just an everyday occurrence of someone who already knows the language. Now, it would be a miracle if I went down there and spoke and either in the English language and they understood it or when I stepped across the Mexican border, all of a sudden I became Spanish in my speaking and I could speak it fluently even better than they did. Now, that would be a miracle. But that's not going to happen because the Bible said it's not. The Bible said that those things have ceased. Talking from the peanut gallery. Okay, another thing. <laughs> We've got... Uh, that they believe is faith healing. Another gift according to the Pentecostals is that if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you also have the, the ability to heal. These, quote, healings are performed either through a simple touch of the hand, or if you remember some of the preachers back in the 80s saying, lay your hand on the television screen. I guess now you can do it on the computer screen as well. And you'll be healed. Well, I've never seen anybody healed by touching television. They may have got a little shock. A little static electricity, but that's about all they got. I remember back in the early 90s where some of these so-called faith healers were exposed. One guy had one of the little small cattle prods, has a two-pronged electrical shock on the end of it. He had one of the short ones taped to his arm underneath his suit, and when they would come up and he'd smack them in the head, well, he'd put his hand back enough that thing would come out, and they'd get a jolt all right. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. There's a little electrical shock. I don't know what kind of batteries you had in it, D batteries or 9 volt or something, but they got them on either 9 volt or D shock or whatever they had. I've seen those things, but I'm not a farmer, so I've never had ones. I don't know what they use in them, but they are batteries, and that's all they got. And they tried to prove that they were healing people, and they were feeling the electrical shock themselves, the Holy Spirit coming in them. It just shows the kind of frauds and fakes these people are. I also saw, a, I believe it was a Dateline interview back in the mid-'90s, where a guy was supposedly healing people, and there was a guy on a cane, and he was standing up holding his cane like this. And he was going to heal him, but there was a person next to him holding a cane. He knocked the other guy's cane out and, and put his hands on the other guy and then said he healed the one that had the cane. So these guys are fake. They know they are, and people who are around them know they are. They know they're in it for the money. They're not in it for doing what is right. I know the more they can put on a big show, the more money they'll get. I heard of an instance in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was told this when I was in preaching school, that this happened, I believe, back in the 70s, where some of these Pentecostal revivals were going on. And I remember the church took someone that was in a wheelchair and wheeled them right on into the, the assembly. But they knew that uh, what we believe, and they started quizzing people, and they started doing... Uh, applications in order to be healed. And they made them put down the uh, uh, religious affiliation. I'll get it out in a minute. When the guy put down, he was a member of the Church of Christ, they tore his card up and said, get out of here. We know what you're here to do. They knew they couldn't heal. They knew if they were challenged that they couldn't do what they, they said they could do. 
and then make them look bad. So they were screening people before they even let them in the revival to be healed, to know that we don't want to get someone that's going to make us look bad. They wanted to get some ignorant, gullible person that they could put that cattle prod to and make them feel like something's going on and made them feel better. I've got a tape somewhere in my office of Brother G.K. Wallace. I heard a lecture he did on faith healing. And he said that there was a study done in one particular town where the Pentecostals had been coming quite frequently. And they did a study on all the people that were supposedly healed. The majority of the people that supposedly were healed were dead within a year of their so-called healings. They had cancers or they had other diseases that they couldn't heal, they couldn't do anything about. And as a result of it, these people died because they would not seek medical attention. They thought that the preacher had done something to them, healed them all of all of their ailments and problems, and they died. And I'm not talking 8, 10, 12 years down the road, but this was within one year of these things happening. Why do these people only heal the others who have maybe back problems or intestinal problems, supposedly, or things you can't see? I want to see them do a good old-fashioned let the, uh, make the blind to see, the lame to walk, and the deaf to hear. That's what Jesus did. His apostles were able to do that. Why don't these people do that? Several years ago while I was preaching in North Alabama, the congregation had a small television program on our local uh, station. And I had been preaching about the Pentecostals. And I had a Pentecostal preacher call me. And he started the conversation off, Mr. West, can I talk to you without you getting mad and upset? And I said, sure, I don't know why not. I'm a Christian. There's no reason to get upset. We can conduct ourselves as gentlemen. Well, good. I just want to make sure you're not going to get upset. I want to tell you why the Church of Christ is wrong and, and how bad y'all people really are. And he, he proceeded to tell us all of our problems. And when he got through, I said, okay. And, and the main thing it was, you preach Mark 16, 16 in baptism. You forget verses 17 through 20. And all the things that, that we can do. He said, I can heal the sick. I can do all these different miracles. I said, oh, really? I said, I'd like to see some. Who have you healed? I, I said, what limbs have you put on people? How many blind people have you made to see? Well, I, I know that we've healed some people, and we went on and on about it. And I asked him a question toward the end of the conversation. We were on about 45 minutes, I guess. Toward the end of the conversation, I said, uh, I've got something for you. Have you ever raised the dead? You know, they did that in the first century. Jesus was able to raise the dead. The apostles were given these miraculous powers. Said, Have you raised the dead? Well, you know, my son was in the hospital nine to death. I said, I'm not talking about nine to death. I'm talking about stone cold graveyard in the cemetery dead. Well, and my son was, was just, I said, don't even talk about your son. I want to see somebody dead. I said, matter of fact, let's just do this. I got some time this afternoon. I said, meet me down at any cemetery. You pick it. I'll let you go to the cemetery of your choice. And we're going to go down there for a, a raising ceremony. And I said, every person that you raise, I'm going to raise the one next to them. He said, you people in the Church of Christ don't believe in raising the dead. I said, no, and I don't believe you can either, and I'm going to prove it. I said, meet me down at the cemetery. I said, you name it. I said, now, now where do you preach? And he told me as a, one of the Church of Gods in the area. I said, do y'all have a cemetery? Well, yes, we do. I said, well, let's just meet at your cemetery. It's your own folks. Let's see if you can raise your own folks. I said, by the way, how'd you let your folks die? Why didn't you heal them before they died? Well, you know, all of us are going to die. I said, well, the Bible says that uh, you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why are they dead then? If you shall recover them like the Bible says, you should have recovered them. Well, you know we're all going to die one of these days. I said, okay, then you saw people being raised from the dead in the Bible times. Let's go out there. He started screaming on the phone and yelling. He was having a fit. Well, I let him go on for a couple more minutes, and I said, oh, wait a minute, wait. I've let you go on now. Now calm down. I said, the beginning of this conversation, I said, we've been on the phone, what, 45 minutes? I said, you asked me could I conduct myself in a Christian manner and act like a gentleman, and I said, yes, but you're not. Oh, I just get a little fired up every once in a while. I said, so what applies to you doesn't apply to me. I can't get upset at you for your false doctrine. And for you sat telling lies on the phone that you can do things that I know you can't do. You're refusing to go to the cemetery and raise the dead like you claim you can do. And you're the one acting like a madman on the phone? I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I ain't got time to talk to you anymore. I know how you people in Church of Christ are and he hung up on me. You start challenging these folks to do things like that. They can't do it and they know they can't do it. They're fake and they're frauds. 
And when we challenged him to that, and by the way, I challenged him to a public debate, and he refused that as well. Uh, he didn't have time to be going and doing all that. He had to spend his time in trying to heal people and do his ministry. Well, I tried to convince him that if he met me in debate and he proved me wrong and he got up on that stage during the debate and could start healing people in front of the whole audience, then he could prove me wrong and he'd get a bigger, bigger following. He didn't want to do that, though, because he knew he was a fake. Folks, in the book of Judges, the Bible teaches, Judges 17, 6, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It's no different than the Pentecostals' charismatic movement. They do the same thing. They do what is right in their own eyes. Truth seekers will open the Bible up and sincere, with the sincerity of heart, read and study God's word and know God's plan for mankind and obey from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto them and live a Christian life through the teaching of the New Testament and that alone and never have to worry about the Pentecostals or having to be healed some, of some physical malady, but know that we've been healed spiritually through the blood of Christ. And if we serve God faithfully and we have the continual blood of Christ cleansing us, then we'll have a spiritual, they want to call it a spiritual awakening here, where we'll enjoy a spiritual life with, with God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the apostles, and all other saints who have gone before us throughout eternity without ever having to worry about someone having to put their hands on us now, knock us in the head, or shock us with a cattle prod, and say we're healed of something now. We are all going to die, and that man was right. We're going to die and leave this earth, but we need to do so faithfully, and must do so faithfully if heaven's going to be our eternal home. Thank you for your attention this morning. Come here, John. Come here. You stand right here behind me. Which one looks more like a peanut? <laughs> <laughs> What makes up a peanut gallery? <laughs> well, you and uh, well, you. <laughs> as far as I know, if you got a gallery and you call it a peanut gallery, you say there are peanuts in it. Now I'm back to where I was. Which one of us well, stands there? Necessarily talking literal. You don't always have to be literal. <laughs> you know, I've never seen it fail. False teachers, and you start pinning them down on a subject, and say, "Oh, it must figure you." <laughs> He did a great job, and we deeply appreciate it. One of the things that I want to emphasize in dealing with the Pentecostals that he especially emphasized toward the end, you're not dealing with, frankly, you're just not dealing with rational people when you tend to deal with about any sect of those folks. They don't go on what's rational. They are so persuaded that these emotional outbursts and whatever is happening to them is directly from the Spirit that rationality is thrown out the window. If you're going to accomplish much of anything with them in a private study or as we are here as in a debate, the approach has to be that you show the inconsistencies of what they teach and what they do and that they cannot do what they claim and then you have to just teach the Bible truth on the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you're going to reach them because everything about them is, uh, and it's their belief system all wrapped up in somewhat romanticism, but even more so in emotionalism. And that's exactly how you've got to deal with them. And you're going to have to show them, if, if they're teachable at all, you're going to have to show them that what you're claiming to be is evidence from the Holy Spirit that you have what the apostles had in miracles is just not so. And that's almost an impossibility. When people reach that stage of emotionalism, they're not rational. And the first mistake you make with an irrational person is to reason with them because they're not reasonable. Now, you don't have to be Pentecostal to do that. There's enough of that out there today coming from various sections, but that's just the way that, that it is. I was thinking about all the different situations over the years that I faced, as John has, and other preachers who've dealt, especially preaching over the radio on the work of the Spirit and the design and uh, the purpose and the end of miracles, uh, what you get into. When in Van Buren, Arkansas, we had a daily radio program. Came on 11:30, went off at uh, 15 till uh, noon, and so we had a, a, quite an audience. Well, the fellow that owned that uh, was a very much of a Pentecostal, 
And um, we even had trouble with him. He followed me one day because he got so upset what I was saying about these things. I reminded him that the Church of Christ had bought that 15 minutes and it was ours. And he sold it to us and knew it was ours when he sold it to us. That was our time. And thus he was saying, you can use it for why you bought it. And I agreed in the beginning you could have it. And for some, we got it. He we backed off after that. Money sometimes uh, even cools the spirit. But um, he, was, he was something else. Had a lady call me one time when I'd finished preaching a series, or I might have been right in the middle of it, I don't remember which, but I'd gone on into it on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, she, I could tell by her sound of her voice, or at least it sounded to me like this, that she was somewhat elderly, but she was highly irritated, very upset that I had pointed out that no one received the baptismal marriage of the Holy Spirit today. And I had already taught what it was for, that it was a promise, as John Will taught, and not a command. And it was only a promise to certain people for a certain reason and for a stipulated period of time. And she just yelled out at me over the phone, you have a devil. Well, I thought there were probably a number of people that would agree with her, but not for the same reason. Uh, nevertheless, she said, you have a devil. I said, I do. I said, and you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit like the apostles were? I certainly have. I said, cast him out. She said, well, she kind of did like I'm doing now. I said, look, if you had been given the Holy Spirit in the same way the apostles were in the baptismal measure, to do as you think and as you teach that it ought to be done, and you have the power to cast this devil out of me, and it must be true, you have the Holy Spirit through his wisdom, you can see what I have, and you don't cast it out and you have the power to do it, you're going to be held accountable for my soul on their judgment. Wham, the phone went down. At just simply taking her position and arguing with it to its ultimate conclusion, which she couldn't do. And that's what I'm saying about dealing with these people. When Brother um, Guy Woods in 1974 debated Benjamin Franklin, the apostate member of the church in Gadsden, Alabama, I was privileged to be there. Brother Nichols was still alive, and uh, he was there. A number of brethren were well known in that day and time, and John understands how it was back there in those days, even though he was a uh, uh, a little peanut in those days. Uh, uh, he was still in the shell, he said. <laughs> anyway, there was a man there. I'd seen him quite a few gatherings over there, especially in those days at the Freed Hardman College Lectures. He's a rather tall man, six two or three, something like that. And his arm was off at the shoulder. And um, they were in this business, like John said, to this Pentecostal preacher he dealt with. In the middle of the debate, it was in the Gadsden's Municipal Auditorium, Gadsden, Alabama Municipal Auditorium. It was full of people. And um, he challenged him, Brother Woods did, to work a miracle. You claim it, that's what you're here for. You claim you were a church that didn't have it and you learned better and you received the gifts of the Spirit and now you're trying to enlighten everybody that the church ought to have it and so on and so forth. And so this, he said, Brother so-and-so, would you please stand up? Well, everybody's sitting down, this tall man stuff with his arms right off here stood up and his arms are off here and he put him on the spot and uh, he pointed out, he said, well, I can't do that unless he believes I can do that. Well, that's the same old Pentecostal stuff that we always heard. So Brother Woods merely pointed out to him, he said, well, he said, Lazarus is dead in the tomb and Jesus still raised him. He said, surely this man has as much faith as the dead body of Lazarus did in the tomb. Now, that's exactly how you deal with these people, whether it's one-on-one. -on -one or otherwise. It's been some rather interesting things. I could, these stories, some of them go on. And brother, I got directed from the folks who were involved in it. I, I will leave you with one from Brother G.K. Wallace. He went into Kansas back in the 1930s to preach a meeting. He did not go for a debate. Brother Wallace stood about this tall. And uh, you would call him a, a fighting banny rooster. But uh, he might have stood that tall, and he did physically, but he stood taller in this building otherwise. And uh, he said, in those days, oh, I wish it was like this again today. He said, the Pentecostals met me, and they were going to make me have a, a debate before I could ever hold a meeting. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Brother Woods used to say, the best thing that ever happened to the church, if all the denominations got together and decided they would destroy them off the face of the earth and to advance on it with the idea to do it. We would grow, and we would expose the truth more than any other way. But anyway, he said, uh, I wasn't prepared for it from the standpoint of going up there to do it. But he said, okay. So they had some auditorium. 
and said, uh, the man sat over here and he here, and they had a big uh, place for to put their sheet or charts or blackboard back up here. And um, he said, now, I, I, if you could ever see Brother Wallace, some of you that knew him, he said, the only thing they gave me as a pointer was a pool cue. <laughs> Well, of course, you know, a fellow this tall standing the pool cue when it was up here. He said, I started out acting as decently as I knew how to act when this fellow would speak. And I was telling everybody else, let's listen to him. Let's see what he has to say. Let's conduct ourselves appropriately. Because in Pentecostal meeting, you don't ever know what's going to happen. And that's the truth. And sometimes they deliberately do upset everything. Well, this fellow gave his speech. When Brother Wallace would stand up to speak, this guy would get all beside himself, making the racket and carrying on, speaking in tongues, as John Well pointed out. And uh, he wouldn't let that go a little while, and finally got up and he said, Now, I've asked all of you all to be quiet and listen to him, and I've tried to give him a fair hearing. He said, Every time I get up there, here's the way he acts. And the man spoke up and said, Well, I can't help it. He said, It's the Holy Spirit taking over me, and I don't have anything to do with it. Brother Wallace said, I walked over there to him, looking at him at that pool cue. And I said, you're going to sit there, you're going to be quiet, and you're going to act a gentleman, and you're going to let me say what I'm here to say, just like I've done to you. And said, you can see that guy watching that pool cue. And said, you know, he didn't say another word through that time period. And when I finished my speech, I said, this man is said that the third person of the great Godhead, the Holy Spirit, took over him, and he couldn't help himself. It was just God through the Spirit speaking through him. He said, well, if that's the case, you've just seen G.K. Wallace with a pool cue shut the Holy Spirit up. <laughs> now, that's the kind of stuff that brings the point home to those kind of people. And if you're ever going to deal with them, you do that, and then you turn around and teach the plain truth of the